Grace and peace be to each of you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus who is indeed the Christ, the anointed one of God. And let us pray. Good and gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for this day that you have made. We rejoice in it because we rejoice in you because you are the, the maker of this day. Heavenly Father, we're nearing the end of the book of Joshua and you have taught us much in these pages, in these many words. Lord, we ask that we take these teachings with us. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would anoint my tongue to declare the word that you've given to me this day and anoint every ear and heart and spirit and mind that hears it to receive it in faith. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. For your information, <clears throat> we are going to be you know, finishing Joshua in one, maybe two weeks. And you might be wondering, what's next? Right? The Gospel of John. The Gospel of John. So you might want to let people know that you know that we're doing the Gospel of John. And, um, you know, we'll, I hope to go through it rather slowly. I also hope to blog it. And uh, you never know. That could be book number two. You just never know. I don't know. But anyway, that'll take a while. But uh, the Gospel of John, and uh, it's a great, great Gospel. And so that's what we're going to do next. So get the word out that we're doing the Gospel of John. It's a great, great Gospel. Well, last week we heard how the land promised to Israel was divided among the tribes who had not as yet received their inheritance. Reuben, Gad, Manasseh, Ephraim, and Judah had received the land of their inheritance without lots being cast for them. Then, after... Completing a survey of the land, the remaining tribes received their land and their cities. Within each tribe's land, cities were allocated to the Levites with their common lands so that the Levites could have pasture for their flocks. There were 48 cities set apart for the Levites, then they were spread throughout the 10 tribes. Also, six cities of refuge were assigned from among the 48 cities uh, given to the Levites, and these were the cities of refuge. And if anybody killed somebody accidentally, without intent, they could run to those cities, flee to those cities, and be safe from the avenger of blood. Now we were told that the tribe of Simeon wasn't going to be given a particular territory in the promised land. They were going to be, you know, scattered throughout Judah. And the reason we were given last week was that the area Judah had received was too much for them. Well, there was also an underlying reason for it, why Simeon and Levi were spread throughout and not given their own specific area. Listen to what Jacob said in Genesis 49. Simeon and Levi are brothers. Instruments of cruelty are in their dwelling place. Let not my soul enter their council. Let not my honor be united to their assembly. For in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they hamstrung an ox. Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. What had Simeon and Levi done, which led to their father uttering these words on his deathbed? They had slaughtered Shechem for defiling their sister Dinah. And all the men of their sisters, they slaughtered Shechem for defiling Dinah, but they didn't stop with Shechem. They killed Shechem, they killed Shechem's father, and all of the men in the city while they were recovering from being circumcised. You see, they made a deal. And the deal was, okay, we'll let our sister marry you, Shechem, only if all of your men become circumcised like us. 
Well, it takes a while to recover from that. And on the third day, when they were still sore, Levi and Simeon went and attacked them and killed all the men of the city. So, Jacob's prophetic word was given to the descendants of Levi and Simeon so that they would never be able to live near one another and possibly collude again together to do something horrendous in the future. Now, it took 400 plus years for his words to come to pass, but they did come to pass in the promised land. Now we come to Joshua 22. It is a rather interesting chapter. It begins well and it ends well, but in the middle, there's a tenuous kind of time going on there. And it might not have ended well had the answer given to Phineas and Israel's representative not satisfied them. So let's see what's going on here. Then Joshua called the Reubenites, the Gadites, and half of the tribe of Manasseh and said to them, You have kept all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you and have obeyed my voice in all that I commanded you. You have not left your brethren these many days up to this day, but have kept the charge of the commandment of the Lord your God. And now the Lord your God has given rest to your brethren, as he promised them. Now therefore... Return and go to your tents and to the land of your possession, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you on the other side of the Jordan. Well, let's stop there for a second. I just want to say, isn't it nice to hear that the men, the fighting men, you know, they were aged for fighting, that the men of fighting age from the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and half of the tribe of Manasseh actually kept their word of promise that they had made to Moses and then to Joshua. You know, we've heard so many times how often Israel failed to do what they were supposed to do, that hearing that they did something that they promised to do kept their promise is refreshing. These men kept their word, even though it meant being separated from their families for five, maybe even going on a sixth year. So we don't know what went in that five years, but it was a good, you know, good long time to be separated from their families. So it's some good news to hear. Joshua continues his words to these men in verse 5. He tells them, But take careful heed to do the commandment and the law which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you. Now we might wonder what Joshua meant when he states, Be careful to heed to do the commandment of the law, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you not to worry. He tells it. He explains it. He says to them to love the Lord your God. As we know, if you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, everything else is going to work out. Because you've gotten the main thing, the main thing. Then Joshua tells them to walk in all God's ways, to keep his commandments, to hold fast to him, and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. Now this is the best, best advice that Joshua could ever give these men. So Joshua blessed them and sent them away, and they went to their tents. Now to half the tribe of Manasseh, Moses had given them a possession in Bashan, but to the other half of it, Joshua gave them a possession among their brethren on this side of the Jordan westward. And indeed, when Joshua sent them away to their tents, he blessed them and spoke to them, saying, Return with much riches to your tents, with very many livestock, with silver, with gold, with bronze, with iron, and with very much clothing. Divide the spoil of your enemies with your brethren." So the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, and half the tribe of Manasseh returned and departed from the children of Israel at Shiloh, which is in the land of Canaan, to go to the country of Gilead, to the land of their possession, which they had obtained according to the word of the Lord by the hand of Moses. You know, you've got to wonder in five plus years and all the campaigns and all the cities that they took and everything, how much spoil Israel had amassed. It had to have been a lot. Of course, we don't know because we aren't told. 
But everyone got their share. Now, I'm not sure how the Levites got a portion of the spoil, since the Lord was their portion, their inheritance. We're not told that either. Since Manasseh's tribe was split into two halves, one on either side of the Jordan, they had to take the extra time, you know, with all the combined portion that they had, and split it in half so that they could go one to this side of the Jordan, one to the other side of the Jordan. I can imagine that dividing up the spoils was pretty much a monumental undertaking, which probably would have been better if they, you know, after each campaign they divided up so that it wasn't just done all at once and you look at the pile of spoils and go, oh my goodness, how are we going to do this? But we just aren't given that information, so we, you know, all we can do is speculate. Things seem to be going well. However, Verse 10 presents us with the possibility of some brewing trouble. Verse 10 we read, And when they, the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and half the tribe of Manasseh, came to the region of the Jordan, which is in the land of Canaan, so they haven't crossed over yet. They're still on the west side. The children of Reuben, the children of Gad, and half the tribe of Manasseh, built an altar there by the Jordan, a great, impressive altar. How many of you are thinking, oh man, they were doing so well. Why are they mucking it up now? If that's what we're thinking, it's possible that the nine and a half tribes are going to be thinking the exact same thing when they hear that an impressive altar has been built by those two and a half tribes. Verse 11 says, Now the children of Israel heard someone say, Behold, the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, and half the tribe of Manasseh have built an altar on the frontier of the land of Canaan in the region of the Jordan on the children of Israel's side. What does that sound like? This is mine, not yours. Keep that in mind as we go on. When the children of Israel heard of it, the whole congregation of the children of Israel gathered together at Shiloh to go to war against them. Thankfully, they didn't go to war instead. In verse 13, we read, Then the children of Israel sent Phinehas, the son of Eleazar the priest, to the children of Reuben, to the children of Gad, and to half the tribe of Manasseh, into the land of Gilead. In other words, they had to cross the Jordan to get to them. And with him ten rulers, one ruler from each of the chief house of every tribe of Israel, and each one was the head of the house of his father among the divisions of Israel. Then they came to the children of Reuben, to the children of Gad, to the half-tribe of Manasseh, to the land of Gilead. And they spoke with them, saying, Thus says the whole congregation of the Lord. What treachery is this that you have committed against the God of Israel to turn away this day from following the Lord in that you have built for yourselves an altar that you might rebel this day against the Lord? Is the iniquity of Peor not enough for us? from which we are not cleansed till this day, although there was a plague in the congregation of the Lord, but that you must turn away this day from following the Lord. Okay, so they got an assumption going here. Assumptions are never good, right? Generally speaking, they get you into a whole lot of trouble. But we got to stop here. What in the world is Phineas talking about? What is the iniquity of Peor? Do you all remember Balaam's donkey? The donkey that spoke, (laughs) the donkey that spoke to Balaam in Balaam's language so that he could understand what the donkey was saying. Well, God's people were traveling through Moab on their way to the promised land. The sheer numbers of God's people terrified the Moabites. And so Balak, king of Moab, sent men to get Balaam, who was a prophet. They wanted to hire Balaam to curse Israel. Instead of cursing Israel, Balaam blessed them, for he could do nothing except bless if that's what God was doing. Now that sounds wonderful. 
However, before Balaam returned to his home, he gave Balak some counsel. And his counsel was this. Okay, you know, I'm, I'm going to put it in, I'm going to paraphrase. You know, I wasn't allowed to curse them because God wouldn't curse them. God's only going to bless them. But you know, you can take them out by doing this. Have the women of Moab sexually seduced the men of Israel? And so that's what they did. That's what they did. So while Israel was at Shechem, the Moabite women seduced the Israelite men and led the Israelite men to worship Baal, of Peor. Their sin led the Lord to break out against the men in a plague. 24,000 men died. That's how many people were involved in the sexual immorality. Phineas, once these people reminded, you know, Reuben, Gad, and half the tribe of Manasseh, how costly rebellion against the Lord can be. And then he added, it, and it shall be if you rebel against the Lord, that tomorrow he'll be angry with the whole congregation of Israel. Get a clue, people. It doesn't just affect you, your sin. It'll break out against all of us. Then he adds, nevertheless, if the land of your possession is unclean, then cross over to the land of the possession of the Lord where the Lord's tabernacle stands and take possession among us, but do not rebel against the Lord, nor rebel against us by building yourselves an altar besides the altar of the Lord our God. Then Phineas reminds him of Achan's sin and the costliness there. He says, did not Achan the son of Zerah commit a trespass in the accursed thing and wrath fell on the congregation of Israel? Yes, he did. And that man did not perish alone in his iniquity. Remember, Achan, Sin, and Ai. You know? But now we come to the answer. Reuben, Gad, and half the tribe of Manasseh give those who had come to confront them concerning this altar that they had built. Then the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, and half the tribe of Manasseh answered and said to the heads of the divisions of Israel, the Lord, God of gods, the Lord, God of gods, he knows, and let Israel itself know, if it is in rebellion or if in treachery against the Lord, do not save us this day. If we have built ourselves an altar to turn from following the Lord, or if to offer on it burnt offerings or grain offerings, or if to offer peace offerings on it, let the Lord himself require an account. But, in fact, we have done it for fear, for a reason saying, in time to come, your descendants, you nine and a half tribes, your descendants may speak to our descendants saying, what have you to do with the Lord God of Israel? For the Lord has made the Jordan a border between you and us, you children of Reuben and Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh. You know, in the future, they may be saying, you have no part in the Lord. So your descendants would make our descendants cease fearing the Lord. Therefore we said, let us now prepare to build ourselves an altar, not for burnt offering, nor for sacrifice, but that it may be a witness between you and us and our generations after us, that we may perform the service of the Lord before him with our burnt offerings, with our sacrifices, and with our peace offerings that your descendants may not say to our descendants in time to come, you have no part in the Lord. Therefore we said that it will be when they say this to us or to our generations in time to come that we may say, 
here is the replica of the altar of the Lord which our fathers made, so not for burnt offerings nor for sacrifices, but it is a witness between you and us. Far be it from us that we should rebel against the Lord and turn from following the Lord this day to build an altar for burnt offerings, for grain offerings, and for sacrifices besides the altar of the Lord our God which is before his tabernacle. The two and a half tribes, they have made their case. They said it is a witness. This replica is a witness so that your generations to come will look at this replica and say they belong to us because this replica looks just like the one that we have and that's the one they come to and sacrifice to. That was their purpose. They've made their case. Now, how would the group, the delegation, answer them? Verse 30, when now when Phineas the priest and the rulers of the congregation, the heads of the divisions of Israel, who were with him, heard the words that the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, and the children of Manasseh spoke, it pleased them. Then Phineas the son of Eleazar the priest said to the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, and the children of Manasseh, This day we perceive that the Lord is among us, because you have not committed this treachery against the Lord. Now, you have delivered the children of Israel out of the hand of the Lord. And Phinehas, the son of Eleazar the priest, and the rulers returned from the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, from the land of Gilead to the land of Canaan, to the children of Israel, and brought back word to them. So the thing pleased the children of Israel, and the children of Israel blessed God. They spoke no more of going against them in battle to destroy the land where the children of Reuben and Gad dwelt. The children of Reuben and the children of Gad called the altar witness, for it is a witness between us that the Lord is God. Now I did search commentaries, a couple of commentaries, to see if in fact that witness remained a witness or if it ended up becoming a stumbling block to the two and a half tribes. And I could, cert I could find no place anywhere that it ended up becoming a stumbling block and a sin to them. And so it was that the altar was and remained a witness that the Lord is God. Whether you're on the east side of the Jordan or on the west side of the Jordan, the Lord is God. Amen.